Okay, Jesus, thank you very much for coming. Okay. Uh, the other day we um, discussed um, the concept of class. You argued that the fem new feminist movement has a class character. Uh, today I would like to know more about the struggle. So can you elaborate what is class struggle for you? Is um, the class struggle something that is inherent to uh, capitalist uh, uh, relations? And therefore, is class struggle necessarily going to overthrow the existing economic um, relations? Um, I mean, if by necessary we mean that there is a historical necessity, no. There is just a historical possibility. So in other words, um, we may well end up with uh, just <laughs> increasing barbaric, uh, increasingly barbaric forms of capitalism. Um, capitalism is a historical product, so it may end the way he was born historically, but uh, uh, it may end um, to be replaced with something even worse. <laughs> so um, in other words, I think uh, class, what capitalism uh, uh, does is to, it, it has created the conditions of possibility uh, both for class struggle, so for the um, formation of a class agency, and uh, it has created the possibility for, uh, um, uh, for being replaced with a form of society uh, that is uh, much more uh, uh, emancipatory and where people can actually be free. But uh, this is just a possibility. Um, and uh, un unfortunately, I think at the, especially the beginning of the workers' movement, uh, the socialist movement had the, the tendency to think that there was some form of historical necessity that we were uh, all on a train running towards communism or towards co socialism. We have seen that this is not the case, <laughs> obviously. So we cannot have this belief. Um, I think we, we, what we have is, are uh, actual uh, historical possibilities that we need to work hard to realize. So in other words, it depends on us. It is up to us to overcome capitalism and to replace capitalism with something else. Um, and it is only through our own agency, through um, you know, the, the capacity to think strategically um, in what ways we can uh, connect the struggles, in what way we can uh, expand uh, the conflict against capitalism, in what way we can uh, um, overcome capitalism. So this is a strategic political discussion and there is no um, teleology, there is no philosophy of history that can save us. So it is really up to us. Thank you. Um, when we talk about reproductive labor, um, the thing that is usually suggested as a solution uh, okay, it's a strategy of uh, collectivization of reproductive labor, which is a suggestion that we have um, since the October Revolution, basically, and which was present both in socialist countries, as we know, but also in capitalist uh, welfare state. Mm. Now, if we agree, as I would agree, that um, we need collectivization of uh, reproductive labor as a strategy, uh, can we maybe think of some uh, other collectives other than the state, mm -hmm. uh, because for example today we have the case of some really large communities, like for example a, um, a big part of uh, the trans and queer community, mm -hmm. which is relying almost almost exclusively on the community itself and not on the state when it comes to um, knowledge, health uh, and other elements of reproduction. So what kind of um, collectivity we actually need? Yeah. So. I, no, I do agree with the idea of socializing uh, uh, reproductive labor uh, and therefore uh, taking it away as much as possible from the family and from the private sphere. Uh, of course, the way uh, you do this, uh, it can be different. Uh, and uh, there is clearly a problem with the only um, you know, stat statist uh, understanding of what the socialization of, uh, of reproductive labor means. Um, in other words, I think that we should also, um, starting also from concrete experiences that are already in place, you know, uh, ways in which specific communities have organized uh, in a democratic uh, way from below um, care work, social, uh, socially reproductive labor. Uh, we can think about, imagine forms that, uh, um, that uh, uh, entail a much greater uh, democratization of, uh, of these processes. 
Taking into account, however, that for some specific aspects of uh, reproductive labor, you clearly know, res you know, grassroots resources are not sufficient. Uh, and you do need uh, heavy investments. So, you know, like healthcare, for example. I mean, we cannot think of, uh, uh, you know, we can think about, for example, organizing collectively from below in a democratic participatory way, uh, childcare or, um, um, you know, ed education or, uh, you know, the, the care for the elderly and so on. Uh, but also things like, you know, food <laughs> and uh, uh, laundries and so on. But uh, when, it, um, uh, for example, with healthcare, what we, <laughs> what we will need is probably an enormous uh, um, massive investment uh, in, uh, in medical research. We need the technology. I mean, we cannot, clearly we cannot, uh, um, you know, treat cancer <laughs> just by organizing uh, on a grassroots level. So I think we will need both, a combination of, uh, of both elements. Um, and the, but the crucial uh, element, I, I would say, is the fact that we really need to um, make the family much less central, or at least the, the kind of family we have today, much less central to social reproduction than it is today. Uh, so we need to really uh, you know, work towards the dismantlement, dismantlement of the form of family we have today, which doesn't mean going towards individualism, but on the contrary, it means to go towards uh, actually a, a much wider range of uh, care, and affective and emotional uh, relationships. Right. Uh, now with a few questions. I would like to connect your uh, work on uh, social reproduction theory. Uh, with your philosophical research on ethnic philosophy, especially a paper that you wrote on, uh, of course, reading uh, on Stoics. So also related to just what you said just for, uh, about uh, health. As you said, like Foucault wrote the text uh, on the Stoic while he was suffering <coughs> from HIV. And in a similar situation, uh, the feminist poet uh, Audre Lord in the 80s, while she was suffering uh, from cancer, said that taking care of herself is an act of political warfare. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Okay, so in the case of Foucault, I mean, uh, uh, taking care of the self, uh, it, it doesn't have to do uh, with self-help. Uh, self That's not, although, I mean, there is, uh, there is also some, uh, um, you know, today the Stoics, in particular, Stoic philosophy is becoming quite popular on a mass level. But it is uh, sometimes interpreted as uh, in, in terms of self-help. Uh, but this is not what uh, Stoic philosophy actually was about. Um, for Foucault, uh, care of the self means uh, basically subjectivation. So it's, in other words, it's, it has to do with uh, what kind of subjectivity uh, I develop. So how I shape myself as a, as a, as a subject uh, within existing power relations and, uh, and therefore in relation to um, relations of power that also constitute me uh, as, a, as a subject. And he found in, uh, in the Stoics some uh, uh, resources for this, especially in you know, Stoic exercises, uh, Stoic practices. Um, now, this, uh, for me, it is quite interesting. It is interesting on an individual level, not just you know, as an ancient philosophy scholar. I'm also not really an expert of Stoicism, although I, I do teach um, Stoic philosophy, uh, but I'm, I'm more of an expert of Platonism. Um, but the interest of the Stoics for me is uh, really, uh, was also both intellectual, uh, because of the incredible modernity somehow of some of, uh, of the Stoic uh, tenets, for example, in epistemology. But it was also, in, you know, individual, existential, you know, in, in a sense, because uh, I really found uh, uh, both in Stoic text and in Foucault's reading of Stoic text, a way of uh, basically navigating uh, complex uh, situations in which a lot of things do not depend on me because they depend on the social relations in which we are immersed and in uh, uh, social and personal mechanisms uh, that you know, may oppress, uh, oppress me uh, and so on. Uh, but you know, learning also to identify what within this context actually does depend on me and in what way I can uh, constitute myself as a subject uh, endowed with an agency within this context. So, 
to go back to social reproduction, I mean, something that may be interesting to explore is precisely this element of uh, subjectivation um, uh, within social reproduction. So, in other words, um, I mean, the, the, you know, the late uh, work by Foucault on the care of the self was connected to the, um, to the problem of subjectivity and subjectivation. And uh, social reproduction theory also has to do with the subjectivity and subjectivation because it is within social reproduction uh, mostly that people are uh, shaped or shape themselves as subjects. Um, so I think there is quite a work to be done about along these lines. So about you know, sub, you know the, form, the shaping of uh, subjectivities and also the, ro the role that uh, sexuality plays in shaping subjectivities within the sphere of social reproduction. And also another element of interest for me, for me has to do with um, so, so a question that became central to Foucault, I think, in, 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 his, in his late period, which is that, you know, okay, we want to transform the world <laughs> and uh, transform uh, uh, society, uh, but uh, is this possible without also transforming ourselves? Now, I, I do think that we should uh, uh, try to avoid, uh, you know, uh, ideas that you know that, that could be summarized, you know, with the uh, old saying, uh, um, "Be the change that you want to see." I mean, things are much more complicated than this, and it is also not true that uh, a collective social change and transformation just derive from individual um, change and self-transformation. I mean, social transformation derives from collective struggles and uh, politics that also have their own dynamics. But I think there is something important in Foucault's insights um, with regard to the kind of uh, interpersonal interactions and uh, uh, that we may have in our political spaces, in our organizing work, and what kind of subjectivities we want to develop in these organizing spaces. And this is, uh, uh, as a feminist, particularly important if we think about, for example, all the cases of uh, sexual abuse um, or even se direct sexual assault within political spaces on the left, or uh, the reproduction of sexism, uh, um, misogyny, sexist behaviors, uh, or even racist behavior within you know spaces that should be you know on the left or revolutionary or socialist and so on. This is a, a fundamental problem. It's a problem that needs to be addressed by uh, through organizational tools. But I think there is also something to say about the ethical dimension of this problem and uh, how we imagine um, you know, that we should interact with each other uh, and treat each other and what kind of per people we want to be uh, within political organizing uh, spaces. And I think um, especially you know, the most recent scandals about you know, sexual abuse in uh, uh, leftist political organizations that exploded for this reason, I think, uh, should really like, uh, lead us in, also in this direction. I mean, it's not about moralizing politics, but it is about you know, being a bit more aware of uh, you know, uh, our own biases, how we act on these biases, and what kind of power we are actually acting um, uh, you know, on our comrades, fellow comrades. So what kind of power relations <laughs> we can actually nurture, let's say, uh, even unwillingly um, towards our comrades. You basically now answered my next question, which is, <laughs> was about uh, uh, self-help. I mean, in, this, in our context, self-care. Um, yeah, my question was, how could we expand our notion of um, care to go past a more transformative practice, yeah. and I meant this on a like on a level of uh, community and society, not speaking of this popular consumeristic idea of uh, self-care. Um, yeah, so you basically answered the question. Yeah. But uh, uh, an, an extra thing would be: um, Do you think that ancient philosophy can um, help us? Uh, I think question. so. Yeah, no, I think so. So first of all, self-help doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, self-transformation. Um, it may, but not necessarily, but uh, it has uh, more to do often with uh, you know, just feeling better. Uh, while um, for, uh, in, in ancient philosophy, the issue is really like self-transformation. And uh, of course, this is articulated in different ways according to the philosophical school. For the Stoics, uh, the, uh, the central question is to uh, basically live up to, the, to a certain ideal of reason 
and uh, of us as a rational being. And uh, in order to achieve this uh, goal, which actually is never really achievable for the Stoics, <laughs> or uh, it's very hard to achieve, it's very hard to be a, a sage, um, you know, like you, also, you need hard work. So for example, uh, you know, Stoic exercises are not necessarily always pleasant, you know, like they include fasting or sleeping on the floor, or um, uh, the, you know, the, the, a typical exercise is you know, your, the preparation of your death, so imagining your own death and so on. Uh, or another one is imagining, uh, uh, you know, picturing yourself as increasingly as a little dot, so starting from yourself, but then uh, broadening your gaze as if uh, you were, you know, like flying uh, increasingly high. Uh, and this is uh, a way to basically realize the irrelevance of, uh, you know, of, of uh, you as an individual within the cosmos. So in other words, how small you are actually are within the cosmos and so how irrelevant the things that happen to you are within the cosmic order. So it's not, again, it's, not, uh, it's quite different from uh, you know, a liberal <laughs> or a liberal understanding of uh, self-help. But um, besides the Stoics, I think um, uh, ancient philosophy actually does have a lot of resources in terms of you know, care of the self uh, and self-transformation, uh, precisely because of the way in which they conceptualize philosophy. Uh, there is a very famous uh, um, book by Pierre Hadot, um, philosophy as a way of life. Uh, Pierre Do was, uh, um, was uh, uh, an ancient philosophy scholar and a classicist, and he had a big influence on, uh, on the late Foucault. And uh, he insists on the fact that philosophical schools uh, understood in the antiquity philosophy not as separated from life. Uh, in other words, you know, studying uh, uh, metaphysics or having metaphysical discussions about metaphysics, uh, physics, uh, or um, logic, or um, cosmology, uh, and so on, uh, was not uh, uh, separated from the uh, central point, which is, from the central question, which is uh, what kind of life we ought to live, so, which also means what kind of people, what kind of, uh, uh, in modern terms, we would say what kind of subjects we ought to be. Um, so philosophy was really a way of life. In other words, uh, um, it was not just a transmis uh, transmission of knowledge of contents. Uh, a philosophical, you know, a philosophical school, especially in, uh, in the Hellenistic uh, era, but also I would say, you know, like in a school like the academy, you would also, um, so you would not just learn contents, but actually uh, transform yourself. And the idea is that precisely knowledge was understood as self-transformation, and there was not this separation that is typical of modernity between knowledge and uh, uh, ethics, or the, you know, the practice of life, or the, your way of life. So I think uh, there, is some, you know, there are some powerful resources there in terms of, uh, um, of uh, uh, you know, answering the question, or at least being, uh, becoming capable of asking uh, ourselves the question, what, what life we ought to, to live. And there is an interesting point in Foucault, for example, in um, Hermeneutics of the Subject, the lectures uh, uh, on um, the care of the self um, in, at the Collège de France, where he compares uh, the ancient understanding of knowledge uh, as self-transformation to both Marxism and psychoanalysis. Why? Because, uh, um, uh, for example, also Marxism um, is not, should also not be understood just as, uh, you know, like a theory that you learn and, uh, and it doesn't change anything of uh, the way you live, but rather uh, uh, Marxism, uh, um, uh, at least before, you know, like it became academic Marxism, was connected to uh, a project of life and a project of uh, both self-transformation and transformation of, of the world. Uh, so that, you know, uh, realizing, for example, how exploitation works uh, was meant to have a transformative effect. And, you know, now I actually know <laughs> um, that I'm exploited and, uh, and I'm going to do something about it and so on. Yeah, I remember that I was very uh, kind of impressed when I was a student reading Aristotle, how he at the end of the book about politics uh, also mentions how um, the citizens, also children, are supposed to exercise, how they are supposed to eat, <coughs> and so on. 
and this may be, of course, do we need today's political philosophy maybe to to move in this also direction? Because also I remember um, how Angela Davis once said when she was asked about veganism, uh, she said that like philosophers and activists today um, engage intellectually with all sorts of things, but they don't think about the stuff that they put in their mouth. Yes. So this is yeah, this is very yeah. Important. Yeah, no, I agree, and, and I think, um, yeah, precisely that, uh, I think, unfortunately, philosophy has, be, be, because of, you know, it has become, a, you know, an academic discipline, uh, um, and, uh, you know, in political philosophy, usually, like, the, the or at least the, the typical modern understanding of politics is that there is, in any case, a separation between politics and ethics, and this separation didn't really exist for the ancients. Um, in general, all philosophical schools, but also the way in which, you know, in ancient Greece, for example, citizens would think about uh, politics. And in fact, you know, in Aristotle, uh, um, ethics is a part of his politics. Um, so I, I, I think there is something deep there in the sense that uh, precisely, the, you know, uh, I mean, what kind of, li the problem, for example, of, in, of injustice, of you know, political, social injustice, and so on, has to do with the, the problem of uh, in, also of what kind of life we are living and whether this is a life worth living and whether we could actually transform uh, our uh, social relations but, and how this can impact on our interpersonal relations and how we treat each other and how we, uh, we care for you know, children <laughs> or for the others and so on. Uh, uh, finally, uh, could you tell us something about your work on Plato in your relation to the political situation in the States? Ah, yes. So I recently published a book on, um, on uh, tyranny in Plato's Republic. In, uh, and in this uh, book, I analyze both the political argument, so the, the, the connection between uh, uh, democracy and tyranny, as articulated by Plato, and I try to show uh, that um, Plato is really intervening in a, within a debate, within a political and cultural debate in Athens, uh, and it is intervening in such a way as to subvert democratic discourse, um, basically by claiming that uh, uh, tyranny is the natural child of democracy. Now, within the, the debate uh, immediately after uh, Trump's election, uh, starting from an article, a uh, long article by Sullivan uh, making this first, uh, this claim first, um, uh, a lot of commentators basically have started saying, ah, this is the demonstration, this is a proof that Plato was right, that uh, the excesses of democracy can uh, uh, generate uh, tyranny, um, and uh, this is what happens in the United States when we go towards a democratic pop, you know, populism uh, and these democratic excesses, excesses uh, then we end up with tyrants like Trump, uh, so we need correctives to democracy. Uh, and I was quite puzzled by the argument, to be honest. Um, actually, I was also a bit enraged uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, you know, these commentators were using this material from the Republic without being aware of what this material is about. So in other words, uh, the, the thesis of my book is precisely that, uh, you know, contrary to attempts to read Plato as a democratic thinker, Plato is an enemy of democracy. And uh, I mean, I do love Plato, but uh, um, I, I love him for other reasons, not because he was uh, a friend of uh, democracy. Um, and his argument about tyranny is really an anti-democratic attack. This is uh, the function that it plays within the Republic. So it's basically what the tyrant is, in the end, is a democratic leader. Um, but the second uh, main reason why I was really upset is that uh, um, clearly, I mean, it is quite absurd to think that uh, uh, it was an excess of democracy that led to the election of Trump given that uh, the um, US liberal democracy is not a democracy at all. And even, uh, you know, there, has, there have been also studies showing that uh, it is much uh, closer to an oligarchy than uh, to a democracy. Um, and this has to do with uh, uh, voters' disenfranchisement. Millions and millions of people have no rights to vote, uh, either because they're imprisoned 
or because uh, they are on parole, they have been imprisoned, so they lose the right to vote as soon as you know, they enter the prison system, uh, the judiciary system. And of course, it is mostly you know, working class people and people of color. Um, then, you know, voter su uh, suppression. So, for example, uh, uh, you know, a number of states have changed the, the, the rules of identification for voting, making, much, making it much harder for people to access to, uh, to the ballot box. Um, the fact that in, in a number of states you have to travel several miles in order to be able to, to vote. Uh, and then the actual suppression of, of, uh, of uh, votes that have been cast. So for example, because the machine didn't work properly and not by chance, usually this uh, su you know, uh, suppression of votes take, takes place in uh, working class areas and especially in uh, um, black uh, communities. So, uh, there is you know, a large chunk of the population, which means you know, a large chunk of the working class and a large chunk of racialized people in the states who do not have the right to vote or who do have the formal right to vote but actually cannot really vote. Um, and then on top of this, uh, um, there was a study in, uh, in Princeton that uh, emphasized the role of lobbies and uh, big, uh, um, you know, big companies and big donors in determining uh, you know, political outcomes and in determining uh, poli the, the policies that uh, are uh, put in place. So, to be on, not to speak, but then of the electoral system, you know, the, the, the electoral college. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Hillary Clinton actually did win the popular vote by three millions and still <laughs> she, she lost the election. So uh, the system, the electoral system is completely dysfunctional from, the, from a democratic viewpoint. So to say that uh, Trump was elected by, because of an excess of democracy and that we should even limit democracy even more strikes me as, uh, I don't know, like absurd. <laughs> And strikes me, and it, and it is even more absurd because uh, these are kind of arguments were uh, articulated as, uh, you know, defenses of democracy, liberal defenses of democracy against the rise of this tyrannical right. But these were actually anti-democratic arguments, really deeply anti-democratic, anti, anti even you know, somewhat racist uh, arguments, using Plato for this uh, purpose. So I, I wrote an article basically to say. Uh, to say this, like, you know, just leave Plato alone, first of all, because, uh, I mean, if you want to speak about the defending democracy, probably, you know, <laughs> that's not the proper resource. Uh, but also, let's actually, instead of, you know, philosophizing about how Plato 2,500 2, years ago was right, let's actually have a concrete analysis of the current situation and how the election, uh, elections take place in the States. Thank you very much. Welcome.